We're back. We we're are. Back. We're we're back. I oh no! <laughs> Wait, I did it. No, I did it wrong. Too. We're gonna. Do, we have to practice our pointing. Welcome back, everybody, uh, <laughs> to our little monthly thing that we do that we affectionately call Fire and Ice. This is like volume twelve, I think. Yeah, and, sounds uh, about right. Yeah, next to me is Lauren Rosen, my my pal from the West Coast, licensed practicing therapist, specializing in anxiety and OCD, and all that good stuff. So uh, Lauren's here to answer questions with us, like she always is, and we're going to chat for about 20 or 30 minutes. Yay. And I already forgot which way to point. That's so good, right? Like literally, am I, whatever. Yes. So this, for anyone joining from my end, is Drew Linsalata. He's amazing. He's actually in graduate school, which we were just talking about, to become a psychotherapist. And mm -hmm. the field will be very lucky to have him. And he's also just a prolific writer and has lots of great insights on, on these topics. So I always well, love our you. talks. Very mm -hmm. kind words. So today, you see is the title on the bottom of the screen here in our fancy graphics that we have, Thought, Urge, or Impulse. This is, I think, sometimes we would think it's a basic topic, but it's important because I think a lot of people are super freaked out right now, even as we speak and as we record, because they, they can't separate what's a thought, what's an urge, what's an impulse. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think there's that fear that like, if I have a thought, it will become, it is also an urge or it will become an impulse. Right. Or it's indicative of an impulse. Yeah. And it I, it's interesting. I didn't tell you this beforehand, but one of the things that I do first with clients, uh, I have, you know, a, a little treatment manual. And one of the things I first do is break down what a thought is, what a feeling is, and, you know, what an, an urge is um, because, because of this very fact. So it's, it may sound simple to people, but it's actually I, it's not something that I take for granted because we don't really parse these things apart in our world. Mm -hmm. That's a them. really good idea. Oh, thanks. Sometimes. <laughs> well, no, it's an excellent idea. Because I think when people get into that worked up state, an anxious state, a fearful state, they, you know, would, would, they never gave a second thought. Now is super important. Yeah. He's apart my emotions and my thoughts and my urges and my impulses and. Ugh. Right. Yeah. Because otherwise, and especially because we treat these things differently mm -hmm. too, especially with thoughts and feelings, right? Am I, if I'm accepting the presence of a feeling, I'm not, I'm not engaging with thoughts, but people often conflate the two. People think, oh, well, in order to feel my sadness, I have to really churn about this really sad thing that happened mentally. Like I have to think about it, which is not necessary or, or turns out helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. actually, true. that's a good point because we are immersed in that. Forget mm -hmm. outside the realm of anxiety disorders and OCD. You know, you got to feel it to heal it, introspection, yep. go inside, dig deep. Like, so we're conditioned almost to think that good mental health is attach, glue yourself to those thoughts and feelings and dig into them. Yes. Find that meaning. See what it's all like about. Wallow. Like yeah. there's a, yeah. I, that's the thing too. Like, yes, feel it to heal it. But feeling is actually a very simple process. It's not all of the uh, thinking that happens around things that cause emotion. So that's not pretty to solid. Yeah. Deter us too much, but yeah. No, I think it, it's germane to the topic because I think if you know, feeling is when you say feeling is a simple process. Let's say you're sad or whatever. You've just had a big breakup in a relationship. I I am hurting. Is mm -hmm. is the way to that okay? You're feeling that I, I hurt as opposed to I'm hurting and I need to find meaning in the hurt. Right. Or I need to resolve the hurt. I need to fix the right. hurt somehow, like by figuring out why I'm hurt or and that there's like a compulsion in our culture to process cognitively to think mm -hmm. through and yeah. uh yeah mostly keeps us stuck especially those of us with anxiety disorders who like to think and think and think and think wow we just got big man i completely had that layout wrong all right <laughs> <laughs> just coming no, at you 3d i hope you wore your 3d glasses <laughs> um interesting have you read um chatter ethan cross no book? no i haven't it's really good. It's one of those books that you highlight on every single page. Like I yeah. like the whole book. Um, yeah. Really good. He's a he's a cognitive science psychologist out of mm. Columbia, and he did a whole. He's just dedicated his life to that. Mm. Why do we think so much? Why are we always going inside, inside, inside? That internal mm -hmm. chatter that we all have all the time. Yep. And yeah. how comes it's helpful? Sometimes it's neutral, and sometimes it goes completely off the rails. Yeah. And it is, but it is so functional. It's so important. I imagine it sounds like that's what the book talks about is that there is a function to it that people, oh, yeah. people often are like, oh, well, 
I just, I think all the time and I can't say, but no, like there, there are reasons that you're, you're probably trying to resolve or to, yeah, oftentimes put things in a box and so that we can put them away. Yeah. Tidy them up. But this puts us right into today's topic, which is not understanding the difference between a thought, you know, or assuming that if you think something that it might, it probably means you're having an urge about that thing. And that urge mm -hmm. might become an uncontrollable impulse. Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. So I guess my, uh, my question for you, since I've pontificated a lot on the feeling thing and, and obviously I have thoughts on all of this, but I'm curious, like, what, what do you think of as the, like, what, what makes a thought a thought? Oh, no, not a hard question at all. Let's just get right into the easy one. <laughs> just a simple one, just softball to you. Away yeah. question, right? For a nice meatball, he can get it out of the park. Well, what makes a thought a thought? That's a good question. Well, I guess I probably would say, I'm going to work this through on the fly here. So don't judge yep. me. Don't no at me. Ever. Say. Yeah, don't at me. Um, I think everything is a thought, right? So any, any image, words, whatever comes in your head, that's everything is a thought. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get a little mathematical. Link. Everything is a thought, but not everything isn't every, every urge has every urge and impulse has a thought, but not mm -hmm. every thought has an urge or an impulse. Hmm. So Pretty much yeah. everything that goes in our head is a thought. Mm -hmm. like, I don't think we can, that would be, is that making any sense? I'm completely. No, 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 no. That, no. And I like, sorry to, because it is a big question. I no, but right. I think you're right. I think um, there are all of these different mental events that we might call thoughts, like images um, or words. That's mm -hmm. oftentimes what I, I think about it. Usually they're pictures or their sentences almost. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, from an act perspective, oftentimes, which is so much my, you know, my perspective on on all things uh, working with within the therapeutic context, um, mostly they're talking about words. Mostly they're talking about the narratives and the stories that pop into our minds. And those, but to your point, they can come with images, they can, um, and they can, also come with these other experiences like feelings and urges and impulses. So, but I, when I think of thoughts, mostly I think of words. Yeah. And you're right in the act, act acceptance and commitment therapy, for those who don't Thank understand you. act. Um, yeah. That comes out of that whole relational frame theory, which that stuff will melt your brain. That's all oh I'm processing. Like I'm still trying to get my brain around that, but yeah, right. So it comes as words, but they can be accompanied by images, sounds, all kinds of sensory experiences can originate with thoughts. Yep. And then is there an emotion that triggers a thought or is there a thought that triggers an emotion? Like that's been debated lately in my, my community. I don't yeah. know which comes first. Well, do you have to, do you have to know what comes first? I think it depends on the situation, right? Sometimes you're feeling anxious and then all of a sudden you a thought pops into your mind and then it, it has a stronger tether to it because you've already been feeling anxious. And sometimes you'll have a thought and the thought itself will seem so, unnerving that you start to have feelings associated with it, I think. Yeah, but that's probably accurate. Whereas other times, if you weren't so agitated or sensitized at the moment, that thought would not trigger emotions. It would right. exist, come and go, probably. Yeah. 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 This is good. And this then, is, there, but so it's, it's, what were you yeah. saying? Sorry, I totally it's, it's so, This is so nuanced. It's so, it's so, this is not black and white. This is so hard to define these things. It's so true. But I think the practice, Practicality of it is in people trying to identify what in the world is going on with their experience, right? Because I know, I know, whenever I'm on here, I tend to get so esoteric that I'm like, <laughs> I'm not sure that it's super helpful all the time. But I think there is a real practicality that, to this because if you see, oh look, there's this narrative going on in my mind where I'm having this strong emotional experience, that identifying these different things really sets us up to navigate them skillfully. Yeah, as opposed to an enact experiential avoidance, right? You're trying to avoid those, mm -hmm. those emotional experiences. So I don't want to have a strong thought because then I might have an emotional experience which I must avoid. I right. Can handle that. Yeah. Right. So interestingly, yep. we start to try to analyze, is this a thought? Is it an urge? Is it a feeling? What does it mean? What does it mean? In an effort to avoid that experience, and we literally create the experience by trying to analyze it and make it so that we know for sure what's going on. Yes. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, creating anxiety and tension and all of that through that process of trying to pin it all down is for sure. Um, well, and that's, I think yeah. what we were talking about, 
uh, before we started recording today mm. was the idea that sometimes, so, it, well, should we go to Merriam Webster, our friends? Sure. Um, but, you know, actually, I don't even think it's, it's Oxford. It's Oxford. Dictionary. Yeah. Yeah. Good old Oxford. You know um, yeah, they know what they're talking about. Uh, as a strong, uh, an urge is a strong desire or impulse. And we can all relate to the idea of having the urge to do something like I, well, I, I haven't had a cigarette in over a decade. Right. But like every once in a while, it's like, mm, like <laughs> I would really like to smoke right now. Right. Okay. And, and so that impulse, that desire, that want sort of springing forth at random, I would mm -hmm. call that an urge. But what we were talking about is that sometimes people worry about thoughts being urges or being indicative of urges. Yeah. And yeah, it's tricky, but they are, they are different things. And just because you have a thought doesn't mean that you're necessarily wanting to do something or that you will do something. Is there, that, I like your smoking example. That's really good. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's been a long 10 years since you had a cigarette, but every once in a while, and I've heard people say that every once in a while, like after a meal or you're out socially, whatever, like, ah, oh, I would really like a cigarette right now, right? Yeah. Is that an urge? Yeah, it's probably an urge, but I would think, can we attach like a positive, what's the word I'm looking for? Not necessarily reward, mm -hmm. but a positive outcome to an urge. Now you might understand that there is a negative, there's a larger negative outcome. I don't want to start smoking again. It's not good for me. But in this moment, I would get pleasure and a reward out of a cigarette right now. Yes. It's kind of like the urge to do a compulsion in the yes. context of OCD. It's like right now it might feel relieving to do this compulsion in the mm -hmm. very same way that it might feel immediately gratifying to pick up a cigarette and light it. To your point, I would be really bummed if I did that on a lot of levels. Right? Like I, it's not yeah. good for my health and I would... Uh, feel frustrated and annoyed that that, that had happened. But yeah. Speak. Yeah, I, I get that. Yeah. 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 A little abstinence yeah. violation effect for you, right? Like I'd feel like, ah, oh, damn it. Blew it. Yeah. yeah. Not that I advocate for that though. Um, because obviously we all, but yeah. So then if it's a positive, let's talk like, because I know everybody's worried about like, I'll have a thought, it's an urge, and then it'll turn into an impulse and I'll do the thing that I don't want to do. Like I'll, I'll turn the wheel and drive off the bridge. I'll hurt my dog. I'll say some. I'll scream curses in church. Whatever they're worried is going to be the thing. Okay. Yeah. So if the urge is generally, generally associated with a positive outcome in the moment, stress reduction, relief, tension relief, a positive feeling, whatever it happens to be, the cigarette would be fun in that moment. Okay. Yes. Fair enough. The ice cream cone would be great in that moment, and then I would be angry about it because I'm trying to lose weight. Whatever it is. Or I have a stomachache. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, yeah, I have a stomachache or whatever it is. I have yeah. you know sprinkles in my beard. It's not good. So I think <laughs> if it's a positive, there's a positive outcome associated with that. Maybe there, and I'm mm. I'm completely making this up as I go along. By the way, this is not science science here. But mm. it's if there's a positive outcome associated with that, maybe it's more likely that the urge gives rise to an impulse. I oh, that pizza looks really good. Like yes. I really because there's a positive outcome. The pizza tastes good, right? right. Like. Right. There's you know, an outcome that I want. There is an I'm outcome that correct. I genuinely would enjoy experiencing. Yes. I yeah. really like, you know, Rush, well, poor RIP and Neil Part. So I'm going to buy those tickets. I don't have the money, but I'm going to buy them anyway because it's, I really like, they're my favorite band, whatever it is. Right. Right. As Whether or not you have the money. Yep. Exactly. Correct. Exactly. And then it becomes an impulse that you wrestle to control a little bit, which, you know, we all have that in some measure. We're not entirely self disciplined all the time. No. But it, let's flip it on our head. Now it's something that you do not want. You absolutely do not want. I do not want to punch my grandma in the nose. I don't want to sleep with my teacher. But I'm yeah. having this thought anyway. That's not going to become an urge because it's there's no positive outcome there. You're worried right. that, correct? Right. The th it's more that the thought is there that what if this it's becomes an urge. an urge? Right. And or yeah, what if this is indicative? Or I had that thought while I was like clenching my fist. That must mean that I really do want to punch my grandma in the nose. Uh, which is here's a tricky one. Mm -hmm. I think it, uh, the fact of the matter is sometimes, depending on who your grandma is, you may very well want to punch her in the nose, right? Like Happened. there are some obnoxious grandma. I loved both of my grandmothers, you know. I hope of that both of them are resting in peace. <laughs> like I'm not, I didn't actually want to punch them, although I've, you know, I've 
been known to want to punch a person or two in my mind. And that would be enjoyable in theory uh, in the short term, you know, but I think it, it can be hard. I see this a lot in OCD with harm thoughts, right? If you're really frustrated with somebody and then you have a harm thought that it's like, well, do I, is that an urge? Yeah, I see. I could see where the emotional context might make it feel more urge-like, urge-esque, yes. if you will. Uh oh, but I'm angry. That mean, and I thought that at the same time. Uh oh, must mean, mean? Yeah. yeah, which I, mean yeah. I do it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I get that. That makes sense. Um, it was interesting because when I had Marty Seif on the on the podcast, which is going back two years, he was mm -hmm. so aggressively adamant that thoughts do not become uncontrollable urges, you know, like, and he's literally built his entire professional life on that. But, yeah. um, you know, so that was nice to hear, but I, I, and I have to wonder, like, is it because is isn't something you don't want you, you're freaked out by the idea that you might actually want to punch your grandma. I love my Which, grandma punch her. Of course. I'm freaked out by it. So if you're freaked out by it, that's a really good indicator that it's, it's not an urge and it's not going to become an uncontrollable impulse. Yes. And at the same token, the thing that we have to be very careful about is how often you're revisiting that information when these feelings come up. Because as we've talked about so often, the first time that we go over it, it's educational. And it's important to understand that, no, 100% of the time, we don't see that thoughts equate to urges. Mm -hmm. And yet it can quickly devolve into trying to reassure yourself that this thought and this, this, this sensory experience that you're having, that you're calling an urge, isn't a genuine an urge. And if we're still trying, we're constantly trying to convince ourselves that's like, no, I don't really want that. Mm -hmm. Then we may lose the thread pretty quickly. Yeah, you're probably right. And then you wind up in that situation. I had to write about it last week, the, the old backdoor spike. Now I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not anxious enough about it anymore. So that must mean it is an urge now. Damn Definitely. it. Yeah. Now it's an urge because it's not making me anxious anymore. Now I, now I guess I really want to do it. Now it must be. Right. So exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the the whole idea of and uh, uh, so if we're talking about thoughts more generally mm -hmm. within the context again of acceptance and commitment therapy and mindfulness part of the problem is that we're just giving them all too much importance whether they're true false right wrong doesn't matter so much as the fact that they themselves are thoughts mm -hmm. right and we still they don't mean anything in and of themselves. And I think the same is true of urges just because we have an urge. Like I've had so many urges that are genuine urges, like the mm -hmm. urge to smoke a cigarette that I haven't acted on. Oh. Right. So I think that there's also this component of people think, Oh, well, if it's a real urge, then it's going to happen. It's like, well, you do get some say in that, I think. Yeah. And we, I, my gut tells me that we all deal with that on a micro level all day long. Should mm -hmm. I do? Should I not? You know, we're making those little tiny decisions. We don't even think about them. Yeah. We resist tiny little urges all the time without even knowing that we're doing it most likely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, mean, I would much rather just sit with my feet up and watch Netflix, but <laughs> I have to, I have to do this. Yes. I just resisted an urge. I didn't even give it any credit, but I did. I resisted an urge. So. Yep. Yeah. And sometimes we don't, right? Like uh, not to freak people out, but I, I find myself doing this even at, like at the end of a long day and I've got like maybe a note or two to finish up for, for within my work as a therapist that I'll notice I'll be on another website, right? All of a sudden, like I'm, I'm off of my note and I'm like searching something that was on my mind and I'm like, whoa, that was quick. Like I got off track pretty readily. So I, I it's not to say, right? Like sometimes we, we, I think we have to, to bear in mind that sometimes we do things without thinking, which is probably very triggering to a lot of people watching this, but, um, but that also does, and we have to accept uncertainty. We have to accept that we don't know whether or not we'll snap, snap right. and lose our right. minds and do something that we don't intend to do, like punch your grandmother in the nose, poor grandma. Um, but yeah, she did nothing we, wrong. She really didn't. She didn't. She does not deserve to be punched in the nose. But we have to accept the possibility that that might happen um, while understanding that just because something is present doesn't like a thought or mm -hmm. this sort of physiological sensation that we're calling an urge doesn't mean that it's actually going to happen necessarily just because That's it's there. Possibility, probability thing. Like just exactly. because it's possible doesn't make it probable. And the, the existence of a thought about it doesn't make it any more probable. Right. Right. It just it doesn't change the math at all. Yes. 
Yeah. yeah. But we're so enamored of our mental experiences, aren't we? We think that they're so much more important generally than they are. It's, it is fact. I could, I could spend the rest of my life literally researching this. It amazes me how important my, my thoughts, how, no matter how ridiculous they are, they are so much more important than yours. Yeah. So much more. Like I, you know, I can dismiss your thoughts. You could call me a, a moron without even thinking about it. Yeah. But you can't do it to yourself. Why do we have that? You know? Yeah. I mean, well, and I think that part of that is because they do generally come with some sort of emotional charge. True. Your thoughts don't come with any emotional stakes for me. No. My thoughts don't come with any for you. So I get that. Yeah. Yeah. So is it a, you know, in the end, and we always, I think we're really good at this. We bring the conversation back to the, the answer that no one wants. <laughs> is, is it I a don't know that's a great special thing. Thoughts? It's all, who knows? It's all, it's none. It doesn't matter. Like in the end, the bottom line in this discussion is it kind of doesn't matter. Trying to pin it down to be sure it's not an urge or an impulse is the worse problem. than if it was an actual impulse. That's the problem. Yes. Like, yep. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, it's completely down to that. It's like, well, and I think the, the recovery side of things is to say, maybe I do. Mm -hmm. Maybe I do have the urge to punch grandma or to um, hurt my dog or to, um, to, to swerve my car off of this ramp. And that's yeah. unnerving, but I don't have the answer to that. I can't like, if I know that if I try and go down the rabbit hole and pin it down, I'm just going to be like throwing pins for the rest of my life. <laughs> like, this is, yeah. 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 Trying desperately to pin down a thing that cannot be pinned down. You no. cannot gain certainty on that ever. Mm -mm. It's like trying to prove something isn't true. You know, you can't prove a negative. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. you, can, you can't prove that you won't do a thing that's or won't feel a thing or won't think that you can't prove that. There's, it's impossible. Yeah, I think that this is where our education in like the scientific method is really helpful because yes. recognizing that we can't actually prove a hypo or disprove a hypothesis or pr no. Going back, right? You can't. <laughs> oh my gosh, there's so many negatives. You can't prove, you can't prove negatives. a negative. You can't. Yeah, you, you can't prove it's a negative, right. but you can also can't prove that something is true. We keep theories. We say like, okay, I don't think it's likely that I'm going to punch my grandma in the face, so I'm just going to go with that until there's counter, there's evidence counter to that, and then this thought comes up, and I'm like, well, uh, is that evidence of for or against? And and looking at how thoughts work, well, no, it's not. It's not. Uh, compelling evidence anyway. It could mm -hmm. mean something, it could not mean something, but it's nothing that I can hang my hat on, so to speak. So I have yet to to make any sort of forward movement with that theory. And so we're just going to leave the theory at it as it is that mm -hmm. probably won't, but we'll see. Which of course we always have to acknowledge feels incredibly reckless and irresponsible and yes. dangerous. And like, how can I just let it be? Because then it feels so much like I I can't just leave that be yeah. well, go ahead and don't leave it be. I don't know what to tell you, but I always wind up getting in that situation where it's like, I'm not trying to minimize it, but then don't leave it be. Go ahead. Wrestle with it. Tell me what right. that's doing. It's actually stopping you from punching your grandma. Of course it's not. No, but I think sometimes people do have to do it in order to prove to them or to understand better that there's no resolution. I know that I had to do that for years and years before I finally gave up the ghost and said, look, there is no amount of ruminating that's going to stop the, the thing that I don't want to happen from happening or help me to absolutely figure this out. It just doesn't exist. So I can either stop mm. living my life and really keep trying or yeah. stop and live my life and live with the uncertainty. But you're absolutely right. There's no, the, it's important to recognize it is very, very scary. Um, yeah. But that's where, when we're going back to what we were talking about at the beginning with the thoughts and the feelings and the urges and all of these different experiences that when we recognize that it feels scary, that we can open toward that. We can be with the feeling, not the thoughts, not the thinking about the thoughts or the urges, but the emotional experience. Oh, my, my heart is pounding. Like I feel it very definitively beat by beat pounding in my chest. I feel a lump in my throat. I feel a tightness in my jaw. Can I breathe in as though I could make space for those physiological sensations as I'm as I'm with them? And that's what it is to feel a feeling, not mm -hmm. 
thinking about whether or not you're going to punch your grandma in the face, but recognizing that it's very uncomfortable to not know whether or not you're going to punch your grandma in the face and then to be with all of those physical experiences and then to or reorient toward your life. Yeah. And in that moment, I can be with that experience as opposed to trying to avoid it, which is one of those principles of act. Like, I, I, So I'm having an experience right now and I'm going to do everything I can to stop having it. Right. And I think when you say like, you know, what are you feeling right now? It's well, not what are you thinking? What are you feeling? Well, right now I am really afraid that I'm going to pick up a knife and do something terrible with it. That's a statement. Right. I feel afraid right, right now. Right. But I don't have to use that feeling to try to predict what I'm going to do in five seconds, five minutes or five days. Yes. That's, that's pointless. Right. And I, I think even as you're taught, you're like, I feel afraid that I'm going to pick up that knife. Mm -hmm. That witnessing in that, that if we pull back even further, it's just fear. Right. I'm afraid. I'm, I'm just afraid. afraid. Yeah. Yeah. And I can be afraid. I can be afraid in this moment. I can have this experience. I'm okay. I'm flexible enough for that. Yes. I yeah. get lots and lots of space for my fear until it naturally passes and is just replaced by something else like yeah. annoyance, anger, happiness, uh, curiosity, neutrality. neutrality. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I get it. Um, and you know, you always find it interesting that this very same thoughts that were absolutely terrifying. This conversation itself would have been impossible for me to have. It's oh. just that, that meta, like almost existential, let's think about our thoughts and what thinking really means. Could never have had that. I would have been an absolute dumpster fire for days. <laughs> yes. But yeah. now I actually relish having the conversation. Same exact thoughts, different yeah. experience that comes with it now. How could that be? So that tells you something too, I think. I think absolutely. Oh, that's such a good point that it's like your, your experience around but it's your experience around the feeling that's changing too, right? Is that yes. you're like, oh yeah, there's that unnerving thing again. Now I have that. Now you have that. And instead of immediately going like, make it go away, it's like, oh, it's it's arrived. <laughs> there it is. There's the right. it's sort of like uh, uneasy, like the movement in my stomach and the lift and the the whole cascade of things that happens. Yeah. Um, Sometimes it's not fun. It's just not. No, but, but if we're good. curious about it, then it's it no longer has to be about fun or not fun. It's just an experience. It just is, right. It's another, yeah. and you'll have thousands of experiences every day, emotional, intellectual, physical, just let them all happen in the end. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a beautiful Rilke quote to that end. Let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. Uh, just keep going. No feeling is final. Oh, we just, I'm going to hit the end button now because we ain't going to get any better than that. That was perfect. That was a, that's a great, great, great quote. Where does that come from? Uh, it's uh, Rainier Marie Rilke, uh, Letters to a Young Poet. Uh, and I actually, I think I heard, I read that quote for the first time at the end of the film, in, uh, not Inglorious Bastards. It's another film about World War II. Um, oh, what is it called? Um, Jojo Rabbit. There it is. Oh, Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you watched that film, but it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Very, very Good moving quote. film. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right, guys. Well, how's that for not answering with any sort of certainty? <laughs> we're never gonna, you know, and, and I hate to say it, but we're always going to disappoint you. You're going to come here and make you feel better and certain and we never do, but we, hopefully we help you navigate through that uncertainty. Yes. And maybe we make you help you feel better about feeling uh, discomfort in the uncertainty because, you know, at least seeing that the two of us have managed to do it somehow, some way. Yeah. And it's not a problem. I think too many people, I understand why I used to interpret it that way too. No, no, no. If I feel bad, then it mu there must be something I could do about that. That, mu yeah. that means there's some other step I'm missing, right? No, it's the feeling bad that teaches you how to have the feeling bad experience. It's okay. It's part of the process. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, you can, for sure. We're cooking, guys. I think we're done. I will put up my usual on the screen here. So if you're not following Lauren, you should on Instagram, <laughs> at The Obsessive Mind, or go to theobsessivemind.com, right? Yes. Uh, that's true. All of your stuff is, is certainly there. No problem. Yes. Um, yep. Tell us again where you practice, though. What states can you practice in? I practice in California and Nevada and Florida and Utah, and I think, fingers crossed, soon to be Oregon. So we're, I'm waiting. I'm waiting on the Oregon board. So how do you have time to record with me? You must just be taking exams all the time. No. <laughs> it would seem that way. A lot of uh, a lot of licensure through reciprocity at this right. point in my career, but, um, you know, people move and I always am like, Oh, I don't want to have to like, it's a lot yeah. to go through having a new 
therapist and all of that when you have an established relationship one, yeah. with one rather yeah. so well fingers yeah. crossed for oregon let's see what happens so yeah and uh and if drew you wouldn't mind throwing up your info oh, yes. okay. yeah, that's uh, me. go over to instagram at the dot anxious dot truth no it's the wrong there we go um and also the anxious truth.com and and check out drew's podcast it's awesome and his books he's got great stuff yeah have you been on the podcast I don't know yes. if you've been there. You have once, once or twice, right? Once, I think. Yeah. Oh, I can't remember. That. Yeah. Well, hey. hey. You know, I'm always hey. game to come hang out and chat with you. I'm just sitting here waiting to hear from the Oregon licensing board. I have nothing <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, uh, if you're listening, thank you so much for uh, yes. looking over my application. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening, anyone in Oregon, she's, she's worth it. Just let her in. It's fine. It's um, all right, guys. Thanks for coming. We'll see you again next month. Yes, as always. Sounds good. Bye.